Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Levo. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs at Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, welcome to our April 14th, 2020 pandemic planning webinar, uh, where we'll talk about some of what's going on this week in relation to our pandemic preparedness efforts as an organization uh, and some of the next steps we expect to see in the very near future. I'm joined by um, several panelists today to talk about some issues that we've identified as important based on for sure what's happening, but also the questions that we're getting about what's happening at our COVID-19 email line. Uh, staff have been sending in questions, so we try to address the topics that are um, um, most, uh, most important in that forum. So I'm joined today by Rob McIsaac, our President and Chief Executive Officer, by Dr. Dominic Mertz, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control by Kirsten Krull, our Vice President of Quality and Performance and Chief Nursing Executive, and Leslie Goche, our Vice President of Clinical Support Services and Surgery. So thank you all for being a part of this today. Um, Rob, I wanna go to you first um, and talk a little bit about what's, what's happening this week, what are you, what's our current state, um, and what do you think is topical uh, for the days ahead? Sure. Uh, thanks, Aaron, and thanks everybody for uh, attending today's webinar. Um, I thought I might just start off by offering my thanks to everybody for your work and your commitment, um, your flexibility over the past four to six weeks. I think many people have made extraordinary efforts uh, over this time to help us get into a position where we're prepared, uh, or at least as prepared as possible for the current pandemic. I think everybody has been working with the uncertainty and anxiety that goes along with waiting for something negative to happen. This is difficult at the best of times, much less in the context of a worldwide pandemic that's having horrible impacts in other parts of the world. So um, again, thank you. Your hard work, uh, your flexibility is seen and it is appreciated. I do think while it's premature to predict exactly where things are headed uh, with this pandemic, it, it has to be said that all of the physical distancing that has been taking place in our communities uh, is having some impact. And I think we haven't seen, at least to date, uh, the kinds of uh, populations, patient populations uh, coming to us that have happened in other jurisdictions. So I think from my perspective, that's good cause for continuing, for doubling down on our efforts uh, to contain this virus to the extent uh, that's possible. Last week, we launched a suite of resilience tools for our organization. I hope you've had a chance to check out the toolkit uh, and to pull out whatever works for you. The Resilience Toolkit, as a reminder, is accessible on the Hub, as well as on HHS's website uh, for those without Citrix access. Last week, we moved to the next phase of our PPE strategy. On Saturday, we began rolling out universal masking to all patient-facing areas across HHS. We made this move despite ongoing concerns about the supply of PPE, but in our best estimation last weekend was the appropriate time to move forward with this initiative. Having said that, I would rush to add that this approach will only be sustainable if we continue in our commitment to PPE conservation measures. Please treat your PPE as the most precious resource that it is. We'll continue to work with vendors and the province and the federal government to procure additional PPE supplies. We've begun publishing a dashboard on our website, which gives you an idea of how much PPE we have in real time. In the meantime, we need everyone's best efforts at conserving what we have. Kirsten and Leslie will speak more about universal masking uh, shortly. Uh, with that, I pass it back to you, Aaron. Thanks a lot, Rob. Um, 
Dr. Dominic Mertz, I'd like to go to you next uh, and talk a little bit. I think it's a great opportunity to level set where the rest of our conversation by talking a bit about the trends we're seeing locally and provincially. Uh, as Rob pointed out, uh, there's perhaps, you know, too early to lay claim to any victory. We have a long way to go in the fight against this pandemic and to protect ourselves from it. Uh, but what are you seeing in terms of the numbers right now? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, I will start off as I did previously by just a summary of cases we currently have in Hamilton as per today, April 14th. Um, so far, uh, 256 cases. And the, the proportions haven't really changed over the last weeks. 14% of the cases were hospitalized. We have 3% deaths. 50% um, of patients uh, are uh, in a, or occurred in long-term long -term, uh, care facility residents or retirement home residents. And roughly half of the cases have been resolved based on the public health criteria for resolution of symptoms. When we go to the next slide, you will see the uh, current EPI curve for Ontario. And when you look at this, it looks very promising, but I, I think I keep reminding people of the fact that never look at the last bar in any time series, because this may still change. But at least it looks like um, we have a more or less constant number of new patients or new cases per day over the last two weeks and lately looks like it's if if there's any trend in here that i would like to read out of this it looks like the number of cases are decreasing when we look at our hamilton data uh, on the next slide um, the uh, the brown line at the bottom is your covid 19 cases you see that the overall number of cases have now caught up with what we had um, in terms of number of cases of flu b uh, throughout the, um, the winter season. Um, and again, you see quite a flat uh, curve here. It started to increase from week 11 to week 12, but since the pace is pretty steady, and again, seems to have flattened a little bit over the last week. Again, the current time point, um, not really valid yet because we are still in this uh, week, so in week 16. And so is this, when we hear people talking about a slow surge here in Hamilton, is that what you would point to this data to corroborate? Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at the pure numbers, we, we hover around 10 new cases per day or 10 new confirmed cases per day, knowing that there might be other very mild cases out there which we may not be capturing. Uh, but with 10 cases per day in, in an area of the size, population size of Hamilton, that's clearly a slow surge or a flat curve, if that continues to be true. So it's certainly not the surge that we expected or feared and that, frankly, we have prepared for, which is good news. And it looks like physical distancing does have an impact on, on our curve at this point of time. But this also reminds us, and um, we repeat that message as well, this is a marathon and not a sprint. And gladly, we are not in a sprint situation as they had been in Northern Italy and New York. We are really in a marathon with this. And it could be a very long, slow surge. So maybe that trend just continued with very limited transmission within our community. Or we may see a second wave at some point. That, that really depends also on the public health measures and for how long are we to stay in a lockdown and to what extent can we reduce some of those measures more from a public health perspective, that this may impact the number of cases, of course. Um, it certainly comes with benefits from us that we are on a slow surge. Uh, we have more time to prepare. Um, the lab capacity increases every week, so we can do more and more testing and hopefully capture more and more of those mildly symptomatic cases as well. And uh, PP supplies remain, uh, we remain a black box to some extent. It may get better, it may get worse. Our hope surely is that it will get better with the situation, particularly in the US, also 
um, going more into the direction of um, less cases per day. So we will see, but it's certainly, a, we are on a long run with this and um, we just started. Thank you very much, Dr. Mertz. Um, I want to go now, let's talk about PPE. Uh, Kirsten Kroll, Leslie Goche, um, you can sp split up the content here a little bit, but let me start with just the, the number one question I have, which is, you know, we've recently moved to universal masking following um, a number of different policy shifts. Why now? Uh, why have we moved to this particular policy at this particular time? So thanks, Aaron, and it's Les, and I'm happy to start this conversation. So the most important concept when we talk about infection control practices and PPE is as an organization, our first priority is that we're providing the care for the COVID patients and protecting our teams from the risk of transmission. The second principle that we work with is what people are referring to as forward facing. And that's where the concept of universal masking is really important. So any member of our teams that are forward facing our patients, um, the intent is that the staff will wear a mask and that mask will be protecting our patients, our families, or our coworkers from the risk of transmission from ourselves. So, what, what it is, how we get there, implies that at the start of my shift, I would be given a, a surgical mask. I would wear that mask for the duration of my shift, unless it's soiled or damaged, or I need to take it off to you know have my coffee, have my lunch. Um, and the concept is that, as Rob said, you're gonna treat that PPE very precious and only get a second mask at the point of which your first mask is soiled or damaged. So universal masking are teams that are forward facing our patients and families and coworkers would have a mask. As we've tried to work through how do we do this knowing that PPE is still a scarce resource, um, the priority has been given to the teams that are working in the clinical units with our patients on a daily basis. Um, and we started the weekend with our inpatient units and providing education and training to them on universal masking. Um, as of today, we've gone out and talked to our ambulatory um, clinic teams or diagnostic teams that are working Monday to Friday. But it really is with the goal to reduce transmission between everyone. So the most important concept that people hear is that we can only continue to support universal masking and protecting each other from each other if we work really hard collectively um, to maintain our inventory of PPE. And that is we need everyone's help in the organization to make sure we're wisely using that mask that's being handed out to people from your charge nurse or your supervisor or your manager at the start of your shift. So one of the things we'd like to share is there's a lot of attention in the media to supplies of PPE and what is actually our inventory. And what we now have available on the hub, you can see in this slide. Um, so this will be updated and kept update by our logistics team, but we're basically flagging items that we are in critical supply. So seven days or less are the red listed items. Items that we believe we have eight to 15 days supply are listed under the yellow bar. And items that we currently have 15 or more days of supply are listed in the green. So this is intended to help keep our teams informed. People can see that right now we have an okay supply of level one masks and the N95 masks. Um, but what we're actually concerned in our logistics teams working very hard is to help source our level three and level four disposable gowns. So this will be your go-to place if you want to understand what is the status of specific PPE items at HHS. So I think I'm gonna hand it over to Kirsten now to talk a little bit more about the implementation of universal masking. Thank you, Lust. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, so thanks. Uh, so there are a number of strategies that have been implemented in the organization. Um, in some areas, these things have existed now for a little while. Um, the first one, of course, being extended use, which is uh, widely adopted as part of our conservation strategy, where individuals who put on a mask um, would leave it on uh, for the duration that they uh, possibly can throughout the course of the day. So not unlike universal masking, when you come to the unit, put on the mask and you uh, leave it on as long as you can. Um, if, in fact, you were to change to um, a different type of mask, say an N95, at some point in time, you would simply leave that on. Same would apply to face shields if you've donned one of those on, um, because there have been more fluids that have been involved in the care of a patient, as an example, you would leave that face shield on. The main things that are changed between patients are your gowns and gloves, always with great hand hygiene in between. And again, we always need people to use that point of care risk assessment, especially those who are providing care to patients, uh, to determine whether or not they need to change out any of their PPE, depending on the, the situation that they're in. Concurrent with extended use is now reuse, uh, which has been also introduced uh, with uh, universal masking in particular, starting this past weekend. And that is really uh, about an individual who would have a, a uh, their uh, mask from the beginning of the day on. They'd be wearing it for perhaps uh, the two or three hours before their first break. They would put that mask safely away, either in a plastic container or potentially if it's a, a more of a paper mask, could fold it up, put it in a piece of uh, like a, a brown paper bag and would redon it um, safely, again, using good hand hygiene practices when they go back to their uh, work after the break. That would continue on in the course of the day. Um, and again, as Les mentioned earlier, if there's along the way uh, damage to that mask or it's been soiled or extremely wet, uh, you would then get a second mask. But this would apply also to an individual who may have had an N95 on if they've done an aerosol generating procedure, um, not with a COVID patient, but maybe a patient who's got a uh, CPAP or BiPAP somewhere in the organization. They would take that mask on safely, uh, put it in their plastic container, and then redon it um, after, after their breaks. So again, both these practices are now going hand in hand. The next piece to this equation is looking at reprocessing in some areas, um, as an example, uh, where there are higher use of N95s, as an example, we are starting to collect those masks and people are actually labeling those masks. Um, we expect uh, and have been looking at what kind of reprocessing mechanisms might be feasible for us to, to institute. Um, again, as another measure to really uh, bring that closed loop phenomenon uh, to reality. Um, again, uh, we haven't really activated at, that, at this point other than collecting the masks, but it is certainly something that we're actively um, thinking about and may needs to institute um, in the not too distant future if in fact there's some indication that our supplies continue to be extremely strained. Again, I always go back to the main principle, the goal here is making sure we have the right PPE for the care of the COVID patient. So again, we all have lots of different parts of this process that contribute to conservation and making sure that we really uh, protect the new uh, equipment such as a new N95 with the best seal for the care of the uh, patient who is confirmed or highly suspicious. The final piece to this is certainly questions around personal PPE, uh, masks in particular have come up. Um, and certainly if you haven't been issued a, a mask from the beginning of the day, so if you're uh, in areas that are not clinically facing, uh, you, you likely will not get a mask unless of course you're in clinical areas quite a bit, but you are certainly welcome uh, to bring your own uh, cloth mask uh, from home. Again, always needing to be clean. But I would always preface that with the fundamental um, aspects of great infection control is uh, diligent hand hygiene. Again, rule of thumb uh, from the very beginning of this is making sure that hands are clean, they're not going to your eyes, to your mouth, to your nose, uh, to really uh, pr prevent that transmission. Um, the self-screening, always important as everybody does coming into work every day, if you've got symptoms to make sure that you're in touch with that um, and letting health safety wellness know, but also with your screening tool that you would um, then uh, follow up if there are symptoms of any type. And then the issues around social distancing. Uh, same thing at work, always trying to keep that distance of the two meters from people. Um, that, those are your basic rules of thumb. If you choose then, um, if you're not in universal masking area to wear a, a cloth mask, that's certainly up to you and we would certainly allow that to happen. 
some people have elastomere uh, masks that maybe with a, a cartridge that they want to wear. Um, again, uh, if, if you're not in a universal masking area, you're welcome to do that. Um, those particular devices could be quite uncomfortable over a period of time. Um, however, if you're in a universal masking area, we would ask that, in fact, you wear the mask that's been issued to you. That's why you're getting it from the hospital. Um, I might also add, while well, around the uh, personal PPE aspect, is that also if patients and families are coming in masks, they're welcome to wear them uh, to an appointment uh, that may be necessary for them to attend. So uh, thank you for that. It's a lot of information. Um, I guess just in the most uh, direct fashion, walk me through a bit of a day. So where do I get my mask when I arrive? Um, I think you've talked a lot about where I take it off and put it on, but who, maybe another, another question is then, who can help me to keep me apprised as to all of these steps that I need to take? Sure, so the areas that we went live with, uh, universal masking are the clinical areas. So um, we added areas such as uh, general uh, med surge wards over the weekend, um, all the different clinical areas are coming on board and areas such as um, cl uh, clinical support services, so the environmental service uh, folks or porters who are involved with patient care quite regularly uh, would be uh, putting on universal masks, uh, and same with nutrition services as in fact they have a lot of uh, contact on the unit, not only with patients but many different uh, staff on the unit, and that duration of contact is fairly long. And those are kind of the parameters to think about as you're wearing that mask. Other clinical areas uh, came on board uh, today. Um, so we're at April 14th, the uh, ambulatory areas, again, with the educators out and about, uh, trying to use um, some very simple visual diagrams, walking people through how to put on your masks, uh, understanding what is extended use, how to take them off if you're doing a reuse. Again, um, how do you safely handle that so that you can uh, redon it um, after a break and understanding what to do at the end of the day. Again, we'll always reinforce the, the use of hand hygiene and so on, but you would get your mask at the beginning of the day in the area where you're going to work. Um, and again, if you need another mask as the, as the course of the day unfolds, uh, because it's become very wet or soiled or, or damaged, uh, you can then ask for a second mask. And of course, if you're really um, in contact with patients, you know, within that two meter range, Again, you're using good clinical judgment, that point of care risk assessment to determine what are the right PPEs that I need for this patient care that's going on right now. The areas that are not included um, are the non-clinical areas. So um, kind of sometimes called the back office, um, a role like mine, if I happen not to be on the wards, um, walking around a lot and having a lot of contact with staff, um, I would not be uh, involved with universal masking. Um, so again, people need to use a bit of judgment. So if you're kind of in and out of a unit, um, maybe dropping something off and so on, you wouldn't be involved in universal masking. Really the people wearing the mask in the units um, are the ones who are safe. Um, and again, uh, that transmission risk is really mitigated because so many more people are in masks. So if you're in and out, it doesn't really matter. But if you were in a unit, again, having close contact with a patient or lots of contact with the team for uh, longer periods of time, then you should be asking for a mask. But generally speaking, uh, the back office folks, um, because they're not in, in that much contact uh, there, uh, they wouldn't be putting on masks. Again, though, you could choose to wear your own mask. One of the questions that's come through on our staff email line was around the need for containers uh, for a mask. Can you address that? Why would someone need to bring a container uh, for their mask? Mm -hmm. So the educators are doing this as part of the training and you require the container uh, to safely doff your mask um, into the container. Uh, the mask would actually fit within the, the shell of the container. So as an example, a Glad container or Tupperware and so on, making sure it's not too deep, but something that you would just kind of tip your head into with the mask uh, falling into the plastic container with the straps on the outside. You have a lid you can put on top of it with your name labeled on it. Um, keeps it safe while you're on a break and then when you're ready to go back to your work area you'd lift the lid um, and can place the the mask against your face while you're pulling the straps over there are good videos that the educators are using to demonstrate this as well um, it's actually um, works quite well I've tried it myself um, and that's the purpose of the plastic um, container Thanks for that information. Um, an important topic that we're likely to revisit, but I'm conscious of time. Uh, so we're gonna stop there today. 
Of course, uh, those with questions can continue to submit them to the staff COVID-19 at hhs.c.ca or hhsc.ca, excuse me, uh, email line, which is there on the screen. Uh, you can also I'll continue to go to the hub for the latest information on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, and please download the hub app to have those alerts pushed to your mobile device. Um, we'll continue to have these webinars based on uh, the questions that are coming through at that email line that we are receiving and we'll keep addressing uh, and we'll keep responding to those questions as well. Uh, our next one is booked for Friday uh, and we'll distribute that then. Uh, until then, thank you everyone for joining us and stay safe.